I am a sucker for conversations about homes, those we come from, those we build together, and those it is our responsibility to care for. And I couldn't be more honored to introduce our final speaker for the morning, who not only has devoted his life to caring for this earth that we call home through his work at Greenpeace, he also is devoted to this home that we have created here together with the YMCA. This is his second time appearing at a global Y conference. Um, he spoke in Mexico and he left the Amnesty International General Assembly just maybe yesterday or the day before, depending on where you start counting the time zones, to be here with us because he believes in the mission of the YMCA. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the General Secretary of Amnesty International, Kumi Naidu. Thanks. Friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I must confess that I'm feeling a little bit nervous. So let me just say, <coughs> there's a tradition in South Africa that I learned as a young person, when you followed four brilliant speeches like what you've heard, you started by saying, most of the really good points I wanted to make have been eloquently made by the previous speakers. <laughs> and then you said, however, for emphasis, and then you spoke for about two hours. But the other reason I'm nervous is, that I didn't get trained by Ted to do the talk. That's why I got a lectern with some notes. But I seriously am more and more nervous these days. And let me tell you in a story. So I was speaking in the United States some time ago, and I was just recounting the state of the world that we are in. And at the end of my speech, a very unhappy person put up a hand and said, Dr. Naidu, have you heard of Martin Luther King? And I said, yes, he inspired me as a young person. And he said, do you know what his most famous speech was called? Anybody? So thinking it was a trick question, I said it very gently. I said, I have a dream. And she shouted back at me. She said, yes, it was I have a dream. But when I hear you speak, it sounds like you have a nightmare. Everything is, everything is getting worse and worse. Therein lies the challenge of leadership for all of us. How do we speak the truth? How do we not sanitize the fact that humanity is in a very, very dire situation right now on the one hand, but how do we do it in a way that motivates, inspires, and encourages people to stand up and resist the injustices that we see in our world? The moment of history that we have been living in has been called a boiling point, a perfect storm, and a philosopher friend of mine describes the moment that we are in as a moment of global moral panic. And the four trends that he talks about is rising inequality, the fact that today the wealth of our planet is so unequally distributed that some people consume so much and the overwhelming majority have so little and unless we address this question as the Sustainable Development Goals is seeking to do to bridge inequality, we don't have a chance to deliver to our children and their children a more peaceful, a more just and a more equitable future. The second trend is what you could call rising authoritarian power. We are seeing in many countries in the world, including in countries where we didn't expect to have these problems, more and more leaders coming into power using division, using hate, using disunity as a basis to actually win power. We're not just talking about Trump in the United States or Bolsonaro in Brazil or the Saudi, uh, Saudi Crown Prince in uh, Saudi Arabia. We're talking, about, we're talking about Boris Johnson. Yes, somebody's gone to Boris, so I had to acknowledge that. And basically what is worrying is that it seems like all of them are on the same WhatsApp list. <laughs> sharing strategies about how to disunite people, how to use repression, and apparently the Saudi Crown Prince is a moderator of that WhatsApp group. The very same Saudi Crown Prince that led the action of 
murdering in the most brutal way journalist Jamal Khashoggi in Turkey last year and all the powerful nations in the world have stood by one year almost is gone and no accountability for one of the most brutal acts of human rights violations so this trend towards authoritarian power should worry us all just because we have elections in countries doesn't mean we necessarily have democracy the third trend the third trend is xenophobia and today xenophobia is playing out differently it's con it's connected across boundaries recently i was in australia i discovered that steve bannon was just there a couple of months ago i was in uh, uh, france steve bannon was there but let me tell you something i have a big agreement with steve bannon that will shock you steve bannon is right about one thing Culture leads political life. Political life does not lead culture. And we who are trying to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, who are trying to promote human rights and so on, must recognize the importance and power of culture. People change societies through music, through arts, through culture. And we, sometimes who are trying to address those issues, tend to be too intellectual, too jargony, too long documents, and so on. We need to start speaking in ways that brings into the conversation millions of people who need to be at the table, but who are spectators of their own destinies. The fourth challenge is the existential one, and that is the reality of climate change. Now, there is good news. You probably heard people like myself say, save the planet, save the climate, save the environment. The good news is the planet is just fine. The planet does not need any saving. Because if we continue on the path that we're on, we warm up the planet to a point where we deplete our water resources, we destroy our soil, the planet heats up, we're not able to grow food, and what is the end result? We will be gone, the planet will still be here. The good news is, once we become extinct as a species, the forests will recover, the oceans will replenish, and all of that. So let's understand that the struggle to avert catastrophic climate change is nothing more or nothing less about protecting our children and their children's futures. So to those few leaders in the world today that still continue to deny that climate change is real and it's happening and it's already taking lives, we say to them, wake up, smell the coffee and start recognizing the science. We believe the science. We believe the science when the science says we should wear seat belts. Right? The laws are passed, we have to wear seat belts, we get fine. Nobody challenges that. When the science tells us safe sex equals using condoms, generally we don't, condemn, uh, we don't contest it. But when the science is telling us, as it did in October last year, that we have 12 years, let me say that again. Actually, I shouldn't say 12 years, because it's now 11 years by 2030 to get emissions to peak and start coming down at least by 50% reduction by 2010 levels, we should all be shaking in our boots. Sorry, I don't have boots, but... <laughs> and what has happened? There were two days in the media around it, and then it has been business as usual. For Amnesty International, I'm just coming from our conference in Africa, a global conference, where we have said very, very clear, Climate change is one of the biggest challenges facing humanity because it threatens the very possibility of humanity to exist on this planet. And we say to our politicians, they must now realize that we are on a very scary traje suicidal trajectory. They need to recognize that nature does not negotiate. We cannot change the science. We can only change political will. And to change that political will, I believe there is no more powerful force than the voice and activism of young people that we have been seeing all around the world over the last couple of years. So when Greta Thunberg from Sweden would millions and millions of young children. And I feel ashamed. I really feel ashamed, honestly, 
that young people have to go out on Fridays in many countries around the world to force the leaders to change. I got involved as a young activist when I was 15. Right? You know, in my first march, we were fighting against the inequality in education under the apartheid system. And I can tell you in my first march, the slogan was, we want equality, we want equality. By the time the slogan got to the younger kids at the back, they were chanting, we want a color TV, we want a color TV. <laughs> because they thought that was the slogan in the front. <laughs> the truth is, kids in white schools had color TVs, kids in black schools had no TVs. And if I'm brutally honest with you, at that time in my life, I wanted a color TV and equality almost equally. <laughs> But the thing what young people have done is they've brought freshness, they've brought urgency, they've brought passion. For example, I had the chance to march with the young people here in London and I can tell you their slogans are amongst the best I've heard. So as we march past Downing Street, you know where the cabinet meets, two young girls, maybe 13, 14 years old, picked up a banner saying, you can get better cabinets at IKEA. <laughs> a few minutes later, Two 14-year-olds picked up a sign saying, keep earth clean, it's not Uranus. <laughs> I tried that joke in Germany, it didn't work, it got lost in translation. <laughs> so, young people are critical, and what are young people saying to us? If you read what these young people are saying, it's not only about climate. They are saying that humanity has to change the way we think about how we live on this planet. Right? They are saying we need to break the divisions between rich and poor. We need to break the divisions between north, south, east, west. Because one of the things that climate change offers to us is an opportunity. We have lived in a world far too long where we've been divided by north, south, developing, developing, rich and poor. We have to come to the realization urgently right now. We either get it right as rich and poor countries working together and we secure the future of hopefully the majority of our children, or if we continue to pull back and not act with the urgency that young people are saying we must act legitimately, in the end, climate change won't recognize any boundaries and rich and poor, rich countries and poor countries, and even within countries, rich people and poor people will both be impacted. It is true that rich people will have more opportunities to maybe escape in the 4 by 4s when Hurricane Katrina hits New Orleans, for example, as we saw. But ultimately, we have to recognize that we have to look at climate change as an opportunity for us to build the kind of humanity that YM, YMCA has been promoting for so many years. So Martin Luther King, speaking in the 19. 60s said, my friends, as I come to the end of my speech, I want to note that in the field of modern child psychology, there's a very dominant term called maladjusted. Now, all of us want to live a well-adjusted life and not suffer from schizophrenia or other mental illnesses. But my friends, I say to you, by the way, this is all Martin Luther King. They're much too eloquent to be me. So he says, but my friends, as I come to the end of my speech, I want to say that there are certain things in our world that are so immoral and unjust that good, decent people should refuse to adjust to. He went on to say, I never intend to adjust myself to religious bigotry. I never intend to adjust myself to racial discrimination. I never intend to adjust myself to the mindless expenditure on military weapons when people don't have food to eat. And importantly, on the economy, he said, I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few when millions of God's children are smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in an affluent society. He was talking about the United States in the mid-60s. That wisdom is a thousand times more applicable in the United States as it is to virtually every country around the world. And in a longer version of the speech, he says, I now call upon decent women and men around the world to come together to set up a new international association to be known as the International Association for the Advancement of Creative Maladjustment. And it is young people around the world today who are creatively maladjusting. When I heard the speakers, our first colleague from Canada, standing up and saying, 
I refuse to be divided from the people whose lands these originally were. I'm willing to take a sense of responsibility of the history of injustice that indigenous peoples around the world have faced and continue to face. And that is the kind of morality and moral leadership that we need and they are coming from young people. I should also say <laughs> that my generation have run out of fresh ideas. And we must be willing to acknowledge that, right? And I look to young people for the freshness of the perspective, the freshness of the lenses, as some people say, to bring new ideas about how we turn this world around. And some of the things young people are noting, for example, that the biggest disease in the world today is not Ebola or HIV AIDS or influenza. The biggest disease in the world today is a disease we could call affluenza. We're far, you know the word affluent, which means very wealthy, right? Where far too many people are suffering from a pathological illness where they believe that a good, meaningful, decent life comes from more and more consumption, more and more personal material accumulation and so on, rather than what YMCA has been doing for 175 years, which is promoting a sense of community, a sense of community participation, creating opportunities for young people to be in, off the streets and in meaningful activity. And that's the kind of societies we need to be celebrating. It has been in the DNA. It's been in the DNA of the YMCA to promote this kind of public participation. And by the way, some of you might not know this. You know, we talk about civil society organizations and the importance of civil society organizations. By the way, the most one of the largest civil society organizations in the world, one of the most effective civil society organizations in the world, one of the civil society organizations that has the presence in most countries around the world is the YMCA, and all of you should be proud to be part of this movement. And I have thankfully been a beneficiary, I have thankfully been a beneficiary of the YMCA uh, through staying in some of your facilities because they're much cheaper and much nicer than staying in a hotel. Uh, and having participated in many of your activities and as Secretary General of Civicus, YMCA was a member and a very, very active and valued member. So I want to make an appeal to young people right now. We need to recognize that we are not simply five minutes to midnight. We are beyond five minutes to midnight in terms of the clock is running out. You know, with gender equality, for example, it's pathetic that after so many years of fighting for gender equality, we are where we are. However, there isn't a clock saying you have to sort out gender equality by a particular moment. Climate change is a clock on the table. We are already seeing lives being lost. We are already seeing devastation. We are already seeing changes in weather patterns that are quite clearly uh, confirming what the scientists have told us for so long and we need to create space for young people's creativity to help solve out the problem. So for example in Zambia a couple of years ago four young girls between the ages of 13 and 15 for the science project designed a generator that can give you five hours of electricity run on one liter of human urine. If that didn't quite translate, everybody got urine? You're either urine or you're out, huh? you got it? <laughs> Uh, and by the way, um, there are, I've been saying to African leaders recently, I had a chance to address the African Union because, you know, in Bristol, yeah, in Uppsala, in Sweden, in a couple of European cities, they, have, they run their buses on human feces, right? Feces, poo, shit, crap, whatever. <laughs> So I've been saying to African leaders, I refuse to accept that European shit is better than African shit. We have, we have to get our shit together and turn the crisis of climate change into an opportunity. But in doing this, we have to celebrate our humanity. And for me, that's one of the things I find so impressive of YWCA. It is a movement that has celebrated our intrinsic goodness as human beings. And I want to say that one of the things that saddens me is how we have been treating 
our brothers and sisters who have been forced to become refugees or migrants. We have behaved with insensitivity and inhumanity in the main. And we have violated international laws that govern refugees. So, you know, we've had ridiculous situations happen in the last couple of years. In Italy, one mayor who was trying to do more to help uh, refugees in Italy was accused of aggressive solidarity. Is there such a thing? Aggressive solidarity. In the United States, Scott, Scott Warren and three other people who are part of an NGO called No More Debts, who have been putting water and small amounts of food in the desert so that people don't starve to death, is facing 20 years in prison. 20 years in prison for showing humanity and showing solidarity. And in Greece, and now I want to invite you to help me with something, and if you help me, then I'm going to sing a song to close my speech, okay? So let me tell you a story about two people from, from the Greek refugee crisis. Sarah Mandini and Sean Binder. They are activists and are trained rescuers. They gave the time and professional skills to volunteer on the Greek island of Lesbos, searching for boats in distress and helping refugees on board. What brought them together were their shared values of solidarity, their fight for justice, and their own refugee background. Sean's father was a refugee from Vietnam. Sarah is herself a refugee from Syria, who crossed the Aegean Sea in an inflatable boat herself in 2015. When the engine failed, she and her sister, Yusra, now an Olympic swimmer, by the way, jumped into the water and towed the boat ashore, saving everybody on board. Why do they need your help? Sarah and Sean were arrested in Greece in August 2018 and jailed for more than 100 days before being bailed. But why, you ask? They were volunteering with an NGO helping people in need. Well, instead of praise, they are accused of people smuggling, spying, and belonging to a criminal organization and could face up to 25 years in jail. These charges are absurd. Instead of celebrating humanity in action, this government is criminalizing solidarity with refugees in a pattern, sadly, that we are seeing across Europe and in many other wealthy countries in the world, including Australia, New Zealand, uh, sorry, Australia, uh, US, and elsewhere. This is about the kind of world we want to live in. Solidarity is in the DNA of the YMCA. Decency and compassion is in the DNA of the YMCA, Amnesty International, and many other organizations. And this is what Sean told Amnesty. And I quote, what's scary is not that it has put me in jail without trial or that I still face 25 years in prison. It's that it can happen to anyone. And importantly, he said, and I quote, humanitarian work isn't criminal. But importantly, he says, nor is it heroic. Helping others should be absolutely normal. So today I want to invite you to help me to send a powerful message to all our leaders to appeal to them to show more compassion for people who are refugees, who are escaping horrific situations in different parts of the world, a problem or a trend that is likely to continue given that climate impacts are going to create more and more climate refugees. And the message that I want to send, and I invite you to help me and join me, is a simple message to the Greek authorities. They have the power to send the message that they want to change, and we are simply asking them to drop the charges against these two brave young activists. So is that okay that I will turn the camera to you, and at some point I'll read the story, and I would like you to join me in saying, drop the charges, okay? Everybody's cool? Okay, the cameraman, he's got one fancy gadget, he's going to turn it around, so it should be okay. So I have to record this, and then what I'd like you to do is if each of us can uh, put it on Instagram and uh, Twitter and so on, hopefully we can all feel proud, because we believe this is a victory we are about to win, and if we all participate, I think it will just give us that push, and we will get some positive action.
for these two young, brave people. Okay, so I'm recording the script now. Sorry, I'm not very good with technology. You know, I'm a digital, uh, I was told by my daughter, Dad, you're a digital immigrant and I'm a digital native. <laughs> I'm Kumi Naidu, the Secretary General of Amnesty International, and I'm here at the special YMCA 175th anniversary event in London. Today, we salute Sarah Madini and Sean Binder, two brave young activists and rescuers facing jail in Greece just for saving the lives of refugees and migrants. Sarah, Sean, we will fight with you until these absurd charges are dropped. Humanitarian work should be applauded, not criminalized. Me and my friends here at the YWCA, YMCA and the YWCA uh, have a message for the Greek authorities. And the message is, drop the charges. One more time, drop the charges. Thank you very much. In conclusion. In conclusion, I would like to invite you all to rise to the call that the young people have made to make the week of 20th to 27th September the biggest climate mobilization ever so that we can get our leaders to act with urgency. There is a global strike call for the 20th of September and I urge you to do whatever peaceful actions you can to join and support that so our leaders know that we are serious about securing our children and their children's future. I want to end with a story that is a bit sad, but is, don't focus on the sad part, focus on the inspirational stuff. When I was 22 years old, I was fleeing South Africa into exile. And my best friend at that time, a guy called Lenny, asked me this question. He said, Kumi, what is the biggest contribution any one of us can make to the cause of humanity? And I said, that's a very easy question. It's giving your life. And he said, you mean going participating in a demonstration, getting shot and killed, and becoming a martyr? Now, that was happening in South Africa on a weekly basis at that time. So I said, yes. And he said, no, that's not the right answer. It's not giving your life, but giving the rest of your life. To be honest, I was 22 years old that time. My friend Lenny was way ahead of us. You know, he was the only one who understood the intersection between economic justice and environmental justice and so on. And in fact, at that time, I jokingly say he was probably one of only like 5,000 voluntary vegetarians on the entire African continent. So anyway, we hugged each other, shed some tears, flee in different directions. And a few years later, I get the, two years later, I get the message that my friend Lenny and four young women from my home city were brutally murdered by the apartheid regime. There were so many bullets in their bodies, the parents couldn't even recognize them. And obviously I had to think deep and hard when I got the news that Lenny had been murdered. What he was saying is, the struggle for justice, social justice, economic justice, climate justice, justice for refugees, justice for indigenous peoples, all these struggles are marathons and they're not sprints. And the biggest contribution that any one of us can give is to have the passion, the stamina, the perseverance to continue to push and push and push until those struggles are achieved. And YMCA, on its 175th anniversary, has shown that longevity, that stamina, and that perseverance that all organizations around the world can be inspired by. So I want to end, I promised you that if you did the drop the charges with me, I was gonna sing a little song. So I just wanna say, how many of you, I have a quick question for you, how many of you know where your ancestors come from? And I want you to go as far back as possible. Okay, anybody knows where your ancestors come from? As far back as possible. Yes? Okay, go a little bit further back now. Okay, as far back. Uh, Guangdong, China. Guangdong, okay, good. I'm not getting the answer yet that I want. Okay, why are those white people there saying they come from Africa? 
So somebody shouted Africa there, please uh, tell me. Okay. okay, so great. Did you all hear that? It's beyond reasonable doubt that humanity started on the African continent and as the continents shifted apart, people moved and folks worked their way back to Europe and, and I'm sorry that in that process some of you lost some color along the way, sorry about that. <laughs> so, so we know that beyond any reasonable doubt, scientifically, that humanity started in Africa. So I want to conclude with a song with only as two words in it, Pambili, Africa, which means forward with Africa. But given that all of us have our roots in Africa, it's forward with humanity, okay? Aisha, I need some water. <laughs> I'm finishing now. Okay, so let me try. Pambili, 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 Africa. Pambili, 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 Pambili. Pambili Africa. Okay, it's easy, right? All of us now. Pambili, 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 Pambili Africa. Pambili, 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 Pambili Africa. Okay, one last time. Pambili, 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 Pambili Africa. Pambili, 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 Pambili Africa. Muchas gracias, merci beaucoup, shukran, thank you very much. Thank you.